All right, GI system. So real quickly, um, talking about the passage of stuff through the GI system. So we swallow food through the oropharynx, goes down the esophagus, it enters in through the esophageal sphincter into our stomach. The stomach is an extremely acidic environment where we chemically and mechanically break down the food. A lot of things are absorbed in the stomach or it pulls certain vitamins and things out of the food in the stomach and processes them in the liver because we need them immediately. The nutrients, the main bulk of the calories that we're gonna get from there will be um, derived from the small intestines. Small intestines, so it'll pass through the stomach into the duodenal sphincter and it'll enter into the duodenum. This is also where the bile is concentrated. And then it goes into the other two areas of the short and small intestines called the jejunum and the ileum. This is where all of the nutrients are derived from the food. Finally, all of that's gonna enter into large intestines. And in the large intestines, it's essentially diarrhea, okay? The whole function of the large intestines is to remove the water from all of that excess fecal matter and so that it, we are not necessarily wasting unnecessary water because dehydration can happen very rapidly because of diarrhea. If someone has diarrhea for a day or two, five or six bouts a day, they're losing quite a significant amount of water. It's very unlikely that they're drinking enough to put all that back in. The reason why we have diarrhea is because our body doesn't have time to absorb that fluid back in. It needs to get it out of the system because that's just the way it is. So ulcerative colitis, these are bowel diseases. So these are in the small intestines. Ulcerations and open sores, ulcerative ulcers in the colon, colitis. Itis remembers inflammation of the colon with ulcers. Makes sense. Here's the inflammation. Can't really see the ulcers in there, but they're, they're forming in there. They're harder to see. Peptic ulcer disease, again, all, again, forming ulcers. This is usually because the high acid contents of the stomach should not normally reach this area, but sometimes it does, and it can cause breakdown of this, these tissues. Also, the use of some medications can cause this. NSAIDs, medications like... Um, um, Tylenol, ibuprofen, naproxen. Oh, I'm sorry, Tylenol is not. Tylenol is not an NSAID. Tylenol is a different um, type of medication. But um, ibuprofen, aspirin, and naproxen are all NSAIDs. H. pylori, Crohn's disease, cirrhosis of the liver. It's going to be abdominal pain, which lessens while eating a lot of belching and emesis, throwing up, and weight loss. So stress ulcers can occur in the stomach and duodenums of patients who are critically ill, secondary to trauma, burns, sepsis, hypotension, CNS dysfunction, or anyone on a ventilator for a long period of time. It's called stress-related erosive syndrome. A lot of the times this will cause GI bleeding. This is an ulcer in the duodenum. Similarly, it's Crohn's disease, a form of irritable bowel disease, chronic inflammatory disorder, where the body's immune system attacks the GI tract, any location, mouth to anus, typically in the small intestines, though. It's not autoimmune in, the, in nature. We're reacting to microbial antigens in the GI tract. Your GI tract is covered in microbes. In fact, a very interesting thing is you're made up of something like 37 trillion cells. You have about half of those are bacterial cells. They are not necessarily part of you. They are, well, they are part of you, obviously, but they are not necessarily interacting like part of your spleen or your liver, or your kidneys or your skin or your eyes. They are exterior things that are living within you that help the whole system function together. It's seriously at a ratio of about one to one. We used to think it was a ratio of about 10 to one. More recent research is saying it's actually closer to even. Most of these are gonna be in your gut to help break down foods. They're helpful. In fact, very few microbes and, and viruses are actually harmful to the human body. In one quart of seawater, there can be as many as 100 billion different viruses, okay? But only about 1,500 viruses are damaging to humans. So 
we really don't study most of them or even give them names because they don't really matter. They don't interact with us in any way. Their viruses are everywhere. Life is everywhere. You guys would be amazed how much life there is. Crohn's disease, higher incidence of bowel obstruction and increased risk of bowel cancer. One in three people with Crohn's are hospitalized every year. You can see this is extreme, extreme ulcer formation. Not necessarily ulcers, but just these, uh, these blebs. Two diseases called diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Diverticulosis is the underlying disease process, and then when it becomes inflamed, it becomes diverticulitis. So diverticulosis affects 10%, rarely occurs in patients under 40. Characterized by outpocketing of the mucosa of the colon through weaknesses in the muscle wall. Similar, this is more similar to blebs in the lungs, right? Or an aneurysm. Increasing age, hard stools and constipation will cause this. Patients with connective disorders like Marfan syndrome. Marfan syndrome is um, typical in really tall males, almost exclusively in tall males. I got tested for Marfans when I was in uh, elementary school because I was really, really tall and I was really, really skinny. So people thought I had Marfans. I don't have Marfans. I'm very healthy. I do have a friend that had Marfans. He was about two inches taller than me. He's six foot eight and he weighs less than I do. For reference, I'm a six foot six guy and I weigh 235 pounds. So I'm relatively like average, I would say, like physiologically wise. He is six foot eight and he weighs like a buck 90 or a buck 80 maybe. He is very skinny and he has very a lot of trouble putting on weight and he can also do things like hyperextend his elbows, bend his, his index finger all the way back, touch his wrist. I have another friend who has uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is another connective um, tissue disorder. So remember the connective tissue or it's one of the type of tissues that affects our joints, ligaments, tendons, bones, cartilage, all of those things. All of these people are gonna be at higher risk for things and they're also gonna experience a lot more pain because of this, all right? And they're much more likely to damage their, uh, their tendons and ligaments as well. A common belief is that a diet high in fiber will alleviate the symptoms of diverticulosis. However, Recent studies show that a diet high in fiber, which increases the frequency of bowel movements, is actually associated with a worse risk of diverticulosis. 10 to 25% of patients have tears in their colons. Perforations can occur. Finally, diverticulitis is an acute episode due to inflammation, infection, and abscess due to the underlying disease. So there's some of those out pockets forming there. These can become impacted with fecal matter kind of like appendicitis, which we'll talk about in a second here. GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, may be caused by hiatal hernia, which weakens the lower esophageal sphincter. GERD affects about 10 to 20% of the adult population. Usually we have heartburn, but it can cause ulcerations, the esophagus and perforations. So now as we're experiencing, the stomach is regurgitating up into the esophagus, gastroesophageal. The stomach is the gastroesophageal. Hiatal hernia is, so the stomach sits underneath the diaphragm. However, sometimes it can be malformed or it can herniate through the diaphragm. This is going to cause a lot of problems swallowing. Normally these patients are not going to be able to drink any water because it's just going to get down to there and then boom, come back right back up. This is extremely painful esophageal varices. We talked about this yesterday, caused by portal hypertension. The portal vein entering the liver moves about 1,500, so about, that's even more than I said yesterday, blood per minute. Due to liver damage, there's increased resistance to blood flow. The blood is diverted to the inferior vena cava through collateral circulation in the form of varicose veins. Okay, so these are just other passageways the body forms in order to try to get the blood to return it to the vena cava. That's what varicose veins are in the legs. These are varicose veins within your body. You can't see them, but they're very damaging. They can develop in the lining of the esophagus. Most frequent cause of portal hypertension is alcoholic cirrhosis and viral cirrhosis like hepatitis, leading to fibrosis or the uh, kind of clotting and buildup of the blood vessels. 
Fibrosis is caused when the damaged cells are replaced with scar tissue. Remember, fibrosis has to do with fibrin, which is the buildup of those clotting cascades. And that's what forms scars. This is scars inside your internal organs, which causes swelling. You guys know that scars tend to puff up and they take more space. It's just how the, when the body is fixing itself, it's going to fix itself and take up more space than it did before. This has some positive influences. For example, sometimes if you break a bone and it's reset in the right way, the bone's actually going to rebuild stronger and you'll be less likely to break it in that same spot ever again. This is someone with some esophageal varices. This is looking down their esophagus. You can see some of them banded out there. If these rupture, you're going to get a liter and a half of blood per minute. No es bueno. The liver is sitting right next to this. So remember, the stomach has capillary beds and then a portal vein connecting them to capillary beds in the liver. So the liver is not necessarily getting any oxygenation from that. It's just getting the blood to process it. The liver will get its own blood supply but it gets that separately. I'm um, sorry, what I mean by its own blood supply is its own oxygen supply of oxygenated blood. Next, appendicitis. Can anybody tell me what the appendix is for? What does the appendix do? If you can answer correctly, I'll give you 50 extra credit points. Nothing. That's the general consensus, yeah. We, it probably does something or it probably did something it probably helped to release certain flora or fauna or bacterial flora or fauna that helped us fight off certain diseases. Probably diseases that are either no longer a problem for us, no longer affect us, or are no longer existing. We don't really see any purpose for the appendix anymore. The only thing it can do is become inflamed, um, impacted with feces, and then infected. That's called appendicitis, itis inflammation, and then we need to have it removed with an appendectomy. This is very commonly seen as pain in the lower right quadrant, or the, sorry, the right lower quadrant, the RLQ or the LRQ, however you want to phrase it, lower right-sided pain. And it makes sense because that's the area it's in, all right? It's the danger noodle sticking off the end of your intestines, your large intestines there. There's a picture of one that's been removed. It's gangrenous. Cholelithiasis, choli, sorry, cholelithiasis is a condition of having bile or gallstones. What is the purpose of the gallstones? Well, here, I'll, I'll show you in a picture. The gallstones are what, how we release, sorry, gall, bile is how we release dead red blood cells. So again, we're producing quite a few red blood cells every second, 2 million of them every second. So that means we're breaking down a ton of them all the time. They're dying, they're, they're ending the near end of their life. When they're no longer able to functionally carry oxygen, the liver breaks them down, and then it releases them into the gallbladder in the form of bile, where they are concentrated. But that's all the gallbladder does, just concentrates the bile, and then it releases it into the duodenum. By the way, this is what gives poop its color dead red blood cells. We break down the red blood cells, we store the hemoglobin, and then we get rid of this chemical called bilirubin. And the rubin in that has to do with the color red, right? That's what dead red blood cells plus time equals brown. This is why no matter what your diet is, you could eat all vegetables, all meat, all pasta, whatever, and all of our poop is going to essentially be the same color because of dead red blood cells that are making up quite a significant portion of that. Our bodies are actually very efficient at breaking down um, a lot of the food that we eat, but we'll always need to um, get rid of the red blood cells. We can pee out quite a few of them, by the way. It's just more efficient to, um, to poop them out. So gallstones happen when it becomes too concentrated, and then when we try to release those gallstones, they get stuck in the passageways, kind of similar to like a kidney stone. This can actually change the color of your poop. It will no longer be brown because you're not releasing any of those dead red blood cells. It'll actually be like white or chalky, gray, white, because pigments from bile normally give feces its color. We'll notice this with right upper quadrant pain, which can sometimes radiate to the right scapula. We would call this referred pain. Pain at night, 
after you eat fatty or fried foods, nausea and vomiting will be bile stained. The passing of stones in the bile duct with subsequent obstruction can cause shaking, chills, high fever, jaundice, and acute pancreatitis. We need to remove the gallbladder. That concentration of the gall is no longer working for us. We need to just directly release the, the bile into our, um, into our abdomen. This will mean that people that have their gallbladders released or, or removed will have slight changes in their bowel movements from then on. I couldn't say specifically what those would be. Here's some gallstones or gallbladders that have been removed. You can see the size of some of those gallstones. These would never be able to pass through those, uh, those passageways. So again, it gets released from the liver in here, concentrated, and then released into the duodenum. So when we're talking about the genitourinary side, we're talking about the kidneys and the ureters almost entirely. So the number of things that can go wrong with there are obviously urinary tract infections, also known as UTIs, kidney stones, kidney diseases. And then finally, the most severe form of that, which is end stage renal failure. The most common genital urinary complaint is the UTI. More, more frequently happens in women than in men because of the length of the ureters. The distance from the kidney to the output is much shorter than it is in males because in males it has to travel along the length of the penis. And that causes it to be much shorter in females so the chance that some pathogen could enter in and then swim up the ureters to infect them or the kidneys much, much higher. Happens a lot more frequently with the elderly patients or with anyone where hygiene is kind of an issue. Not to say that if you're dirty, you'll get a UTI because they can happen benignly and through other sources, but a lot of times this happens to women also because um, things will get stuck in places. And after use, especially after sex is when we're very likely to develop these problems. So we're gonna have usually some burning, pain on urination, fever, chills, bladder spasms, urinary frequency, but not very much output. <clears throat> and then finally, and this is a very common thing you'll see, the patient will usually be altered just a little bit. They'll be a little bit kind of anxious. They'll kind of be not really understanding things. This is very typical with UTIs and elderly patients. Kidney disease affects about 20 million people in the US. 15% of adults over the age of 20 have physical evidence of chronic kidney disease. 350,000 Americans are on dialysis for end-stage renal failure. Dialysis replaces the function of the kidneys. More than 50,000 people are gonna die each year from this though. So the kidneys, produce and eliminate urine. How do they produce urine? They're not really producing urine. What they're doing is they're eliminating electrolytes and they need some water to do that. And this is what becomes urine. This also helps regulate the body's pH as well as its blood pressure. It's very important. The kidneys are vital. In fact, like I was saying the other day, the kidneys are the only organs which are retroperitoneal. Well, I should say the only abdominal organs that are retroperitoneal meaning that they are behind the peritoneum, or um, it's almost like the mesentery, this, this muscular um, wall that separates and protects your abdominal organs, because your kidneys are sitting on either side of your spinal cord. It's one of the few features in your body that you produced two of, even though one would have done just fine. In fact, a lot of people do this. They'll lose a kidney or they will donate a kidney and while we have to be more careful about everything we do there on, all our electrolyte intake and alcohol intake and things like that from then on, we can still survive just fine with one single kidney. Some serious kidney disorders are kidney stones and then all the things associated with the failing of the nephrons, the functional unit of the kidneys to eliminate um, toxins. Kidney stones, also known as renal calculi, are crystals composed of calcium, uric acid, and, and cysteine. This calcium, again, this is what makes things hard. Calcium is a hardening substance. Most of these stones will be able to pass naturally on their own. 
And by naturally, I mean painfully. By the way, who's at the biggest risk for contracting kidney stones? Well, anyone living in the Southwest or in, in any of these Southern states, there's a whole band traveling across the United States known as the kidney stone belt, kind of similar to the Bible belt, but it goes all the way across. It has to do with mineral deposits in the water. These mineral deposits can build up over time. And if we're drinking a lot of unfiltered tap water, we're at a higher risk to death. get this. We're also at a higher risk for kidney stones if we're not drinking enough water. Every time I say that, I need to take a big old drink of water. So your kidneys are important. They need lots of fluid to do their job efficiently. The more excess water they have, the more efficiently you pee. By the way, a general rule of thumb, if you can smell your pee, you're dehydrated. When you pee, it might have some color. Things you eat and things you ingest will change the color of your pee, right? If you're taking a lot of B vitamins, like B12 and stuff like that, your pee will be a lot brighter yellow. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're dehydrated. In a general sense, yes, you can look at the color of your urine to tell how dehydrated you are, but a better test is the smell. Now, obviously, some things can affect the smell as well. For example, asparagus. And asparagus acts quickly because we want to get rid of aspergine, which is a thing in asparagus. Our body likes having a little bit of it, but it only needs so much. So what's it going to do? It's going to get rid of the rest of it as soon as possible. And you guys will notice this. If you eat asparagus and you pee 15 minutes later, it will smell like, well, you know what it smells like. By the way, not everybody can smell that. And not everybody's pee smells when they drink or when they eat asparagus. Well, most people's pee will smell, but not everybody can smell it, which is an interesting genetic difference with some people. So either you know what I'm talking about or you don't know what I'm talking about. In really severe cases, kidney stones need to be removed surgically. Have any of you guys ever had a kidney stone? Thankfully, I have not, but I watched my uncle go through it and he did not enjoy that process at all. I'm glad I've never had one so far. Fingers crossed. Look at the size of some of those. That would probably need to be surgically removed. Kidney failure can happen either acute or chronic. Acute would happen over a couple days, usually caused by decreased blood flow to the kidneys, trauma, cardiac failure, surgery, shock, sepsis, UTIs, or urinary tract obstructions. Sometimes this can be reversible. Sometimes they might need dialysis until it's healed. Depends on where it's going on. Pre-renal, intra-renal, post-renal has to do with where in the kidneys it's happening. Is it happening before it gets the kidneys, in the kidneys themselves, or in the ureters? Chronic renal failure may, may progress to end-stage renal failure if, again, it's left untreated. <clears throat> Presents with minimal, if any, renal functions, less than 10% of it. Diabetes, hypertension, cause the majority of cases, right? And that should make sense. What is happening with diabetes? That polydipsia, polyuria. So we're peeing, we're dehydrating, we're overutilizing the kidneys. I went to a long series of lectures when I was at the University of Arizona, where we were discussing um, the various differences, uh, what, what it takes to live to 100 years old, centagenarians, which is what you call someone who's 100 years old. Not very many people will live to be 100. About one out of every thousand people has a chance to live to be 100 years old, which is actually a pretty high number when you think about it. Or maybe it's one out of every 10,000. It's not very many though. So they studied a bunch of these. I think they studied over 100 people that lived over 100 and they were trying to find what similarities they had. And they did not find a whole lot. In fact, some people smoked their whole lives some people never smoked a cigarette in their life. Some, some people had 10 kids. Some people never even got married or never or were completely celibate their entire lives. Some people were vegetarians. Some people were carnivores. Some people were, they were, came from all nationalities. They came from all, both genders. What made them similar? Well, there were a few things that did make them similar. For one, they tended to have longer living family members. They had it seems like there is definitely a genetic component to living to be very old and healthy. That makes sense. What else did they have in common? Well, they also were all very small. The smaller you are, 
generally the longer you live. We can see this when we look at like, let's say dog breeds, the bigger the dog, usually the shorter they live. Now that's not necessarily directly correlated. It has to do with the amount of stress we're putting on our body every single day. Someone that weighs more will need to eat more. And someone that eats more will put more stress on all the systems of their body, their GI, their GU system, their kidneys, their renal system, that everything is going to just be used a little bit harder. Finally, they found that these people that lived really long also um, ate less food. So they were smaller and they ate less food. So basically the moral story is the less stress you can put on your system over time, the longer your system will last. It's kind of like if you only use a tool when you need it, you don't use it for every single job and you spread it out, your tools will last longer. There was one more thing they discovered about these people, which is not really a anatomical difference. It's a psychological difference, which is that everyone that lived to be a hundred years old was generally very good at letting things go, letting things kind of slide off their shoulders. They didn't really hold grudges. They didn't really watch things that made them upset. They tended to only intake positive vibes, to, for lack of a better word. They took positive news, positive things into their lives, and that helped them live longer. When we feed into this, um, this mindset of uh, a lot of times it happens in these echo chambers, right? You see it a lot online where people that are all of like mind will get together and discuss, discuss the atrocities that like, let's say, for example, the other political party is doing and how they're all terrible and they're all stupid and they're all blind to reason. And have you noticed that there's a lot of echo chambers like that? The problem is when you're constantly surrounding yourself with this negative mindset, it's having effects on our bodies. This mind-body relationship is incredibly strong. The things we eat affect how clearly we think. So what we think about affects how well our bodies work. Everything is very clearly related. And the people that live the longest are evidence of this. So maybe you should all try to meditate a little bit more or just maybe stop holding grudges <laughs> as if it's that easy. When function is decreased by 15% or less, you're, kidding, you're going to have a lot of effects. You're going to be altered, confused. You're not gonna be breathing right. You're gonna have bone pain, itching skin, nausea, vomiting, hallucinations, seizures. Your electrolytes are way out of whack. Dialysis is essentially doing what your kidneys are doing all the time for free. But dialysis is expensive. Dialysis also takes a lot of time. And that's because it's replacing the permanent function of your kidneys by something that you now have to do three or four times a week for three or four hours at a time. It's going to take up a lot of your life. It's almost like having a part-time job that you cannot escape from. But if you stop going to dialysis, don't expect to live very long. After about three days, you're gonna start getting, feeling really terrible, and getting really sick and infected. And after about a week, you're probably not gonna be alive. Now we're lucky that we live in an age that a dialysis exists because if it didn't, everyone whose kidneys failed would die within about a week. And that's how it was for most of history. Now you'll live a while, not that long. I mean, your chance to live 10 years is only about 10%, but it's still there. You're more realistically chance to live a couple of more years. Not everyone is on dialysis permanently though. Sometimes people will be placed on dialysis if they're undergoing, um, if they try to commit suicide by like, let's say taking a bunch of Tylenol, that can do it. It circulates blood through these special filters called dialyzers to remove the toxins. <clears throat> In order to do this, we need to have good venous access. Unfortunately, if you guys will know, people that have renal failure usually don't have any veins. They're very hard IV sticks. So we'll have to create this thing called a shunt or a graft. Both of them are formed on the arms and we essentially, a, a shunt will, will kind of bind together an artery and a vein so that we have an area to suck blood out of or a graft, which we'll place it in so that way we can um, draw the blood out whenever we need to, because we need to have large bore IV access in order to do this efficiently. But getting large bore IV access on the same patient three times a week for the rest of their life is not going to be very good for them, right? It takes quite a few days 
after you get an IV for your venous um, system to heal from that. And as you guys know, it's going to form scar tissues. So the more you use a vein, the more it's going to be harder to access that vein in the future. We see this not necessarily with our patients, but we see this with IV drug users quite frequently. By the way, if you ever do get an IV drug user, a heroin user, and you need to get IV access on them, go ahead and ask them, hey, dude, where are your veins? And he'll tell you, I got one on the back of my hand. I got one on my foot, wherever. Okay. There's a dialysis shunt. There's the shunt. So what are they doing? You can see from this picture right here, they're putting in a graft, the same as like an arterial cabbage, a coronary artery bypass graft. So they'll take a vein or an artery from somewhere else in your body and they'll make this looping structure so that you can do um, get access through that thing. It will appear like this. They're going to have reduced strength in that hand because blood flow has been cut off slightly. Also, not gonna be able to get blood pressures anymore on this arm, okay? The damage it could cause to the graft could destroy it, and then we only have one more chance. And if that's gone, we're gonna to have to do something like install a central port and that's going to ultimately do a lot more damage. Sometimes people can have dialysis peritoneally done. Remember, the peritoneum separates your abdominal cavity, the, the kidneys from everything else. So we can filter it through that as well. Sometimes, not always. What can go wrong with dialysis? Well, as you can imagine, quite a bit. We're removing blood from the body, so the chance that the heart could become ischemic and have a heart attack is a lot higher. Hypotension, also a very big possibility. Disequilibrium syndrome, change in osmolarity between intracellular and extracellular fluid. Remember, osmolarity has to do with the fluid balances moving from one side to the other. <clears throat> Chest pain, again, due to ischemia. Bleeding, because they're using a lot of anticoagulants because we can't have this shunt healing up and scarring over. We need to keep it flowing. They're also going to have everything associated with bleeding then. If they fall, it's going to be a major concern. High blood pressure, peripheral neuropathy. This is when we stop being able to feel our peripheries, our hands, our feet, our feet especially. Well, that's called diabetic neuropathy when it's caused by diabetes, but it's still peripheral neuropathy. And pericarditis, this is inflammation of the heart. The pericardium is the heart muscle. So when that gets infected, it swells up. Sorry, the myocardium is the heart muscle. The pericardium is the, um, is the sac that surrounds the heart. Hyper-K, hyperkalemia, this is high potassium levels. K is potassium on the uh, atomic chart. We are also gonna see some uh, cardiac dysrhythmia, some EKG changes due to elevated potassium levels. For example, depressed P waves, the QRS will widen out. And then most famously, we're going to see these peaked T waves. We're going to see a picture here in a second. There's the peaked T waves. You can see the T's normally are not this pronounced. They're almost as big as the QRS complexes. Now we're not seeing any QRS widening in there, but that's possible. How do you treat this? Well, calcium chloride or gluconate are used to antagonize the potassium. So we're trying to even out the levels so that there's not an imbalance of too much potassium. Sodium bicarb can be used to treat their metabolic acidosis. Remember bicarb just reduces acidity by raising the pH. Glucose and insulin also promote movement of potassium into cells, and albuterol does as well. Yeah, it says right there, the use of albuterol will cause the potassium to move intracellularly. And here you can see as the, the uh, hyper-K levels rise up there, that gets more and more peaked until we start to see almost a complete malformation. This is going to turn into an idioventricular rhythm. Finally, there's this condition called uremic frost. This is a severe case where the, the skin starts peeing out all the toxins because the kidneys are no longer able to do it. Remember, the skin has sweat ducts, so you will literally be sweating out your urine. It's going to leave a crystal residue. It looks like frost, 
smells like urine. If you have this and you're not already on dialysis, you better believe you're going to be on dialysis. Probably not going to be living that much longer though, if you're reaching this stage, unfortunately. Very rare condition, but it can happen. I've seen it one time and it wasn't a patient I had, but I went into the hospital and that patient was in there and it was very interesting to see. Infection can also occur in the, in the kidneys and we can also get fluid overloads. Patients fail to follow specific instructions for volume intake. They can become chronically overhydrated leading to CHF and pulmonary edema and anemia because we're lacking erythropoietin, which is a hormone produced by healthy kidneys that encourages red blood cell production. Erythrocytes, remember, are red blood cells, and poietin has to do with the genesis of them, the creation of them. Or we're getting poor iron absorption, absorption from loss of vitamins, iron included, caused by removal during dialysis. So if you take a couple Flintstones gummy bites and you go get your dialysis, all of the toxins are going to be removed, but a lot of those positive effects are also going to be removed as well. So these are also considerations for when we're taking medications and timing with dialysis. It can also cause bone diseases, osteodystrophy, the malformation of bones, osteomalacia, also known as rickets, and osteo osteoiasis fibrosis, or the weakening calcium phosphorus deposits. Osteodystrophy chronic kidney disease, mineral bone disorder, the softening on the fibrous degeneration of bones leading to bending and fracturing, osteomalacia, rickets, defective bone mineralization, low levels of phosphorus and calcium. There's rickets photos. And fibrosis, fibrosis, de fibrous degeneration, and the formation of cysts leading to a moth-eaten appearance of the bone. This is going to weaken them, and then we're going to have bone pain and also the chance of fractures.